Welcome everyone to this multi-contribution keynote on tools and technologies for supporting algorithm fairness and inclusion sponsored by Absalom. Inyati Ibuzwa Kwaba Pambidi is a Kosa proverb, which means wisdom is learned or sought from the elders or those ahead in the journey. In this multi-contribution keynote, we will hear from those ahead in the journey. Christian Lum, Achim Zeilais, Dorothy Gordon, and Jonathan Godfrey. Hi, I'm Vibash. I'm the founder and co-organizer of Our Ladies in Johannesburg. I'm a South African woman of Indian ancestry. I have long black hair, which is a little curly at the moment, and I'm wearing a black jacket and a scarf with animal print on it because it's winter here in Josie. I'm sitting in our study at home in Johannesburg. Behind me on the wall are two pieces of art from my kid and one that I made myself with Lego dots that spell out Our Ladies with a little blue heart at the top corner. My love for R runs deep, as you can see and hear. I am joined by my friend, Shell. Shell, please introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Shell Karioke, a data analyst based in Kenya. My pronouns are she, her. I co-organize Nairobi R, our Lady Nairobi, and I'm also part of the Africa R leadership team. It is currently 16 degrees in Nairobi, which to us is very cold. So I'm warmly dressed in a black and gray hoodie. My hair is currently braided and tied up in a bun. And I'm wearing a pair of spectacles because I'm short-sighted. I am seated at my desk, study desk, which is located in one of the rooms in my house. Thank you for joining us and we hope that you will stay with us till the end. Over to you, Vibash. Thanks, Shao. Let's begin. Our keynote session, like all spaces in the conference, is governed by the Code of Conduct. Um, if at any point in the session you'd like to ask a question, please ask these in the Q&A widget at the bottom of the Zoom screen and include the speaker's name if it's directed to a specific speaker in the session. Uh, you can also upvote by liking a question. The hashtag we're using on Twitter is hash use capital R 2021. Our first speaker is Christian Lim. Christian Lim until recently was an assistant research professor in the Department of Computer and Information Science at the University of Pennsylvania. She has since the end of June started a new position at Twitter as a senior staff applied machine learning researcher. And if you've never heard Christiane's talk before, after her part today, you will surely join me in congratulating Twitter in getting her on board. Please join me in welcoming Christiane to the virtual stage. Wow, so that was probably one of the nicest introductions. Thank you so much. Um, don't have much time, so I'll just get right into it and say that today I'm here to speak to you a little bit about some of what I believe are some of the less um, paid attention to um, facets of designing models ethically and responsibly. Um, and I'll get right into it. So if you've been following the discussion about algorithmic fairness over the last, let's call it five or six years, you've undoubtedly come across this article called Machine Bias with the subheading, there's a software used across the country to predict future criminals and its bias against Blacks. Um, this has become one of the major um, test beds for new algorithmic fairness methods as as well as data sets that is used um, to make claims about what algorithmic fairness looks like um, in sort of machine learning and statistics research. Now the crux of this um, article put out by ProPublica was that unfairness in a model, in this case a model that's used to make predictions about someone, whether someone will be rearrested in the future, unfairness in that setting is embodied by the state where the false positive rate between different groups, in this case, different race groups, white and African-American in this case is different. So they noted that the false positive rate for African-Americans was about twice that of white people. And this is shown in that red square um, in, on the figure here. 
And so this is one definition of fairness, one definition of algorithmic fairness that's been going around. And in fact, a generalization of that is just the idea that some predictive performance metric on your model that you're deploying um, should be the same across different groups. Usually those groups are called sensitive attributes. In that first case, it was race, but you could really pick any performance metric to define fairness in that way. And in fact, if you were to sort of pick your favorite performance metric across sort of the standard confusion matrix, say it's um, you know positive predictive value, maybe equal accuracy, certainly there's someone in the world who has, provo who has proposed that a model is fair if that performance metric is equal across the different groups. And over the last several years, there has, of course, been this proliferation of different mathematical notions of fairness, um, group fairness, which I just discussed, individual fairness, procedural fairness, cause of fairness, all, all different and I think very reasonable ways of thinking about whether a model is performing fairly. However, one of one facet of this, and I think this is particularly true of the group fairness types of definitions, is that they take a lot of things as fixed. They sort of take away a lot of your degrees of free freedom when thinking about how to sort of define a model responsibly or ethically. It sort of starts from assuming that the data is fixed, the overall goal is fixed, and those sensitive attributes, the, the groups that you're concerned about, are fixed from the start. And then it's only a matter of equalizing some rate or doing something else to arrive at fairness. And so what I want to impress upon you all today is that these sort of mathematical notions of fairness are really just the beginning of the story. They're not the end of the story. And we really need to expand beyond those sort of mathematical notions of fairness if we want to really be committed to building models responsibly. And so that's what I want to talk to you about a little bit today. Um, and it's difficult to do that in complete generality because part of understanding some of these bigger picture things really involves getting into the weeds in some particular application. There's not going to be any sort of general purpose solution that says this is the responsible thing. It's really a collection of considerations that one might want to make, and those are just necessarily going to be contextually dependent. And so the context in which I've been working for the last several years is in looking at models that are used in pretrial risk assessment. And so a quick cartoon, very quick version of this, just to set the stage for this discussion today. These are models that are used um, throughout the United States um, to make an assessment of how someone should be treated after they've been arrested. So when someone is arrested in many jurisdictions, a model is run that predicts say whether they will be um, rearrested, that's called recidivism, based on input data like um, criminal history, demographics, and interview questions. So essentially a statistical model that predicts a binary outcome, whether they'll be rearrested. Again, this is a simplified version, but for our purposes today, it should work. Based on those predictions, they'll then make policy recommendations, like this person should just be released with no conditions, perhaps there should be some conditions on their release, or release is not recommended for that person. And this and this recommendation or the decision that is ultimately made has very consequential um, impacts on that person's life and their trajectory. Okay, and so again, let's think about taking back some of those degrees of freedom. Let's not think of our data as fixed, but let's think about the ways in which it might not live up to our expectations or it might undermine fairness, the fairness of the model, even if we are able to meet some of the mathematical notions of fairness we set out to achieve. So since we're at USAR, I'm going to assume we're a lot of data scientists and statisticians, so I'm not going to go into this section in too much depth. Um, but when we use data to build one such a model, say a model that predicts whether someone will be rearrested, we have to con we have to be concerned about bias. So sampling bias, for example, when the data is not representative of the desired population. In this case, to the extent that there is a bias in policing, um, and in particular, if people of color are policed at a higher rate than others, then um, the population to which your model is applied and the population from which your model is built may not be representative. Um, and again, even if your model meets some mathematical notion of fairness, this fact will undermine the fairness of that model entirely. You also need to worry about measurement bias. This is when your data systematically over or underrepresents some target quantity. And this is particularly concerning when there's differential measurement bias. So that's to say one group is more over or under um, represented than the other. Again, this comes back to differences in policing. So to the extent that you believe that there is a racial bias in policing, that gets encoded in the data. And so say you're trying to predict whether someone's rearrested, that's not the same thing as reoffense. And so um, it, the model can't disentangle whether this person is likely to be rearrested if the model's accurate because they are the sort of person who is, lives in an over-policed area or because they are genuinely more likely to um, participate in behavior that would be defined as criminal. 
Another aspect of bias that I think gets confusing here is societal bias. So the first two statistical bias, I think as statisticians and data scientists, we're all fairly comfortable with. Then we come to societal bias, which is essentially just objectional aspects of the real world, especially those reflecting inequality that get recorded in the data. And they may be recorded accurately, but we might not want our model to learn those facets of the world because we don't want the model to perpetuate those problems. So for example, um, you might believe that there is truly some um, differential rate of participation in criminal activity based on some sensitive attribute. However, if you build a model that then recommends different groups for say, um, incarceration at different rates, um, that might not actually lead to a better world because you're sort of perpetuating those patterns into the future. You're incarcerating one group at a higher rate and that might not actually um, lead to better outcomes or more equal outcomes in the real world. Okay, and so this is one thing I just wanted to say really quickly is that often we talk about sort of the the foundation or the, the source of unfairness in models is being bias in the data. But this is often conflating many different things. We have the world as it should or could be, and not everyone will actually agree on what this looks like, right? That's sort of a normative decision. It's it's a values laden, it's, it's a moral decision, and it's your vision for how the world should be. There's retrospective injustice and societal bias that gives us the world as it is. I don't think anyone thinks the world is perfect. From there, we measure the world and we get statistical error. And so when we talk about bias, we're talking about all these things, and it gets really confusing and, and difficult to disentangle what we're talking about when we're talking about all these things at once. I'm going to come back to this world as it should or could be, because this is, I think, really the crux of thinking through building models responsibly. Finally, there are some other considerations when we think through using the data. So what sort of information is off limits? There are currently people working on building models to predict re-arrest um, based off of brain scans, so MRI data. Should someone be forced to participate in that sort of invasive data collection process in order to be evaluated by such a model to be eligible for release? Another thing is how does our measurement encode various values? So you might want to encode the value of forgiveness. You might think of doing that by including a sunset window on past offenses. So some of those inputs for criminal history, maybe anything beyond 10 years ago shouldn't be counted. Even if it does have um, predictive value, you might want to encode something like forgiveness in your model. So again, sort of thinking through how you're measuring your data, what sorts of bias exists in your data, how you can correct for that, and what other values you want to encode your data, I think is a really important part of building models responsibly. Another thing that I think gets a little bit under examined are the axes of fairness. So far, I've talked about race. In the United States, this is one of the things that has come up as one of the most important and often um, scrutinized sensitive attributes when we talk about fairness, but of course, it's not the only one. There's gender. And there's, of course, the intersection of race and gender. So depending on which of those attributes you pick, you might come to very different conclusions about whether your model is fair um, if you're defining it, for example, as equal predictive form performance between those groups. So these are two obvious ones. They aren't the only ones. There are many others you might consider. Sex, disability, nationality, age, religion, et cetera, all of these things, intersections of all of these things. Which groups you want to consider and um, be concerned about performance for the model with respect to is again a, an ethical and moral decision that needs to be made um, that is often not especially um, considered or sort of take, taken as, as fixed for the for the task. Another thing that is sort of sco scoping out a little bit, thinking more broadly, the decision space. So I talked about three decisions from the outset, release the person, impose some conditions, or release not recommended. Now if any of the elements of the decision space are to your, to your understanding, uh, uh, inhumane or just fundamentally objectionable, even if you are able to, through your model, equally apportion that recommendation across the population or across different protected groups, that might still not be a reasonable solution. So if you look at the conditions of pretrial detention, you can find reports that talk about a culture of violence where people who are subjected to pretrial detention um, are subject to violence, not only at the hands of the people who are also detained, but also at the prison and jail staff. Again, even if you can equally apportion that treatment, if the treatment is itself unjust or inhumane, is that an ethical thing to do? 
Another thing to consider, um, another one of the elements of the decision space is that there be some conditions on the person's release. A common condition is that the person pay money bail, essentially money they have to pay to, to be released to incentivize their return. At least that's sort of how it's conceptualized. Now in practice, um, what this means is that people who have less wealth are unable to go home. And so you end up with these wealth disparities in, in terms of who is able to be released and who is not. Again, if you have some component of that, um, of that decision space that is fundamentally objectionable, this, this might be a problem no matter how you can apportion it across the population. And finally, there's nothing bigger picture than what is the overarching goal of building a model in the first place. Often when we're building a model, we're predicting some limited set of outcomes um, to help make a decision. These are sort of the, this class of models that I'm concerned about in this case. And so what is the actual goal of doing that, right? For some people, and this really comes back to what I talked about just a few minutes ago with how do you, how, what, what is your goal or what, how the world should or could be. In this case, maybe you believe that the world should or could be pretty much the same as it is now, but it should just run more efficiently. In that case, perhaps the overarching goal of building this model is helping judges make decisions in a better way, more efficiently, sort of helping the existing process move faster. For some people, the existing system is so unjust that it just needs to be reformed entirely. It needs to be rebuilt in some, in some very um, large and grand way. In that case, you might not think that a model supports that sort of restructuring. However, I would caution you that these things get really complicated when you start thinking about the politics of these sorts of models. So for example, we'll often see these sorts of models um, proposed as part of legislation that does something like gets rid of money bail entirely. So you end up with legislation that does away with some, in my opinion, abhorrent type aspect of the standard decision space, but at the same time becomes replaced with one of these models. So if, the, if that sort of legislative change couldn't be made without a model, perhaps one of these models does support that sort of reform. And finally, you have people who believe that the current system is so unjust and so messed up that there is nothing to do but abolish it. So to envision a world, how the world should or could be, right, to envision this world where there is nothing that exists that resembles our current criminal justice system at all. And in that case, you probably do not believe that one of these sorts of models moves us closer towards that goal. And so I'll close now. I know we don't have a ton of time, um, but I'd just like to say that, you know, I think there has been a lot of attention paid to how to achieve these sort of mathematical notions of fairness and much less um, attention paid to some of these bigger picture, bigger scope sorts of considerations that one must make when deciding to build a model. I hope I've given you sort of a case study of how you can think through or sort of examples of things I've been thinking through over the last several years and thinking about models that are used in criminal justice. Um, in practice, there's no, um, I think, general way to make these decisions. I think it is a lot of um, normative decision making that needs to take place. So thank you to my collaborators on um, thinking through some of these various considerations that one should account for. Thank you so much, Christian, for that insightful presentation. Our next speaker is Ahim Zelias. Ahim is a professor of statistics at the University of Innsbruck. Sorry about that. Ahim is a, Ahim is a professor of statistics at the Faculty of Economics and Statistics at University of Innsbruck been an R user since version 0.64.0. Akim is a co-author of a variety of CRAN packages such as Zoo, Color Space, Party, Sandwich, and Exams. In the R community, he is active as an ordinary member of the R Foundation, co-creator of the Use R conference series, and co-editor-in-chief of the Open Access Journal of Statistical Software. Akim, will give a presentation on making the color schemes in data visualization accessible for as many users as possible. Ahim, please take it away. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction and for the uh, invitation to this um, uh, this keynote session. And um, yeah, as we just heard, I'll, I'll try to give you um, a quick overview of some uh, tools and strategies for choosing um, color palettes for data visualization that are more inclusive, specifically to viewers uh, with color vision deficiencies. And um, of course, colors are 
everywhere in data visualization and they're not always easy to choose but sometimes also perceived as being fun to choose because you can put a certain personal touch on uh, on the data visualization however when when doing so you should keep in mind that um, the, the the power of um, color is also limited so if you have uh, the opportunity to also encode the information you put into color into some other way into the visualization it's usually a good idea and I'll show you an example for that. Um, of course, that's not always possible, not um, in all kinds of displays. Then the main topic is um, uh, being considerate towards viewers with color vision deficiencies, which will uh, affect um, a relevant share of your viewers. Um, the number I put here is about 8% of the male viewers in Northern Europe. This number varies a little bit with respect to ethnicity, but it will be a relevant share. It's much uh, rarer in female views, though. But there are, may also be other uh, physical limitations on the side of the viewers or technical limitations, um, for example, uh, with respect to displays or projectors and so on. And the first um, example I will show you is um, a very basic time series di display. I'm using one of the built-in data sets in base R, uh, stock price um, indexes um, on, in Europe, um, and I'm using um, um, a time series line plot, and I'm using the default base R palette, colors one to three and five, and the, the display itself is not so important. It's just a typical time series display. And up to version 3 of R, you would get um, a display like this. And probably you all remember these colors uh, very well. This was this very flashy default palette in, in base R up to version 3. And um, specifically, um, the cyan in this display is too light. It might uh, almost disappear in the background depending on the display, especially on projectors. This was a notorious uh, problem. But even the green might be too flashy. Then there's another problem with this display um, in that uh, we have chosen to use a legend here and the ordering in the legend does not correspond to the ordering of the lines anywhere else um, in, uh, in the display, so it's hard to match these. And this becomes even more relevant uh, if we emulate a certain kind of red-green color deficiency called protonopia. And um, if you do that, suddenly the red and black line look very much alike. And this is what the experience for protono viewers will be. So based on these lines, it's very hard to match which of them corresponds to the DAX, uh, the German stock index, and which one corresponds to the SMI, the Swiss stock index. And a simple solution to that, that has nothing to do with colors, is to, um, rather than using legend up here, you can go to direct labels um, around here. And even if all colors, um, all lines were completely black, you would be able to, to go backwards in, in time and to find out which line corresponds to which label. But of course, we also want to um, improve the colors. So uh, what Base R did, it switched the default palette from version 3 to version 4 to this. And at first, you might say, this is a really small change. Well, you can see that um, the hues remained almost the same and um, the brightness became a little bit more balanced. The cyan is darker now and not um, as uh, bright and flashy as before. But uh, maybe even more importantly, for protonope viewers, if we emulate that again, the um, um, somewhat lighter label for the SMI series can be distinguished from the DEX series. The difference is not huge, um, but um, it might be sufficient in this kind of display. If you want to create um, an even bigger uh, difference, um, you um, you might want to use um, a palette that was specifically designed uh, to be robust um, on the color vision deficiencies, namely the Okabe Ito palette, which is now also in base R. And again, if we emulate protonope vision here, uh, we can see that all four colors remain clearly distinguishable. 
So the good news um, is that Base R finally adopted a better default uh, palette uh, rather than this def uh, flashy uh, colors. They are a bit more balanced now. But of course, Base R is very late to the party with this. So there were much earlier packages that did a better job. Um, first, probably Color Brewer, then notably ggplot2. Viridis became very popular over the last years and a few other packages, some of which are listed here. So many good alternatives um, have been available and some of these are now also available in this base R function called palette colors. And this includes this R4 palettes, the Okabe Ito, some of the color brewer palettes. Uh, we have some tableau colors here and um, all of these can be used uh, for choosing qualitative uh, colors for coding different categories in a display. In addition to that, of course, we need other kinds of palettes for numeric data, sequential and diverging palettes. And before I say something about these, um, I'll um, say quickly something about how you can assess the um, robustness of a palette with respect uh, to color vision deficiencies. There are different packages that can emulate this. One is our color space package that includes um, the swatch plot function that has an argument CVD for color vision deficiencies that can be set to true. And then you get the original palette uh, that you put in and you can use any colors you want for that. And then most importantly, you get these deuteronope and protonope um, emulations that are the most common forms of red-green color blindness. Uh, tritonope, uh, blue-yellow um, deficiencies are much rarer um, as are monochromatic viewers uh, that uh, deserve desaturated colors would correspond to, but still it's a useful assessment to see the changes in brightness here. And you can do the same uh, for the Okabe Ito palette and you can see that the colors are reasonably distinguishable under all forms of constraints. But now we want to move on to um, understanding how other palettes can be constructed. And the model I'm using here is this HCL, U, Chroma, and Luminance uh, color model that tries to capture the perceptual dimensions of the human visual system. The U corresponds to the type um, of color, uh, red, yellow, green, blue, purple, which we could typically use to um, construct um, a qualitative palette. And then the luminance at the bottom uh, goes from light to dark here, changes in brightness. And this is what we typically use um, in a sequential display. And we can accompany it by changes in chroma from gray uh, to um, something bright and, and colorful. And the nice thing about this HCL model is that you can control these dimensions independently. And um, this uh, is in contrast to the more commonly uh, or more well-known RGB color model for red, green, blue that is used to encode colors on a computer, but that just does not correspond to the way we think about colors or we talk about colors. So keeping these U-chroma luminance dimensions in mind, um, I can now say something about uh, how palettes are typically constructed. And we distinguish the most common forms, qualitative, sequential, and diverging here. And as I said before, qualitative palettes are typically used for um, um, displaying different categories um, in, in a data visualization. And um, a good idea is to keep luminance differences to a certain um, a range. In this display up here, I've fixed the luminance completely, which is a good thing if the viewers have full color vision, because then you don't create any distortions um, with respect to the brightness. Um, but uh, this limits the use that can be distinguished by viewers with color vision deficiencies. So actually, this strategy displayed up here is probably not the best one if you want to be um, inclusive towards um, viewers with such deficiencies. And the palettes um, that were shown in palette colors um, all have certain limited variations in the luminance, and that is a better idea for this. Then we can move on to sequential. Uh, palettes that encode numeric or ordered information from high to low or vice versa. And the most important bit is that you use a palette that changes from dark to light or vice versa. You can accompany it by changes in chroma and also in hue, but uh, you should use um, a monotonic luminance scale. 
And finally, for a diverging uh, palette, we would usually combine two sequential um, palettes, um, but with different views that can be distinguished by all viewers, including those with color vision deficiencies, like this green brown scale here. And base R also provides now a broad range of palettes used uh, or created with this HCL model in the HCL colors function, including um, some inspired by Color Brewer, Viridis, Carter Color, um, and uh, Psycho, for example, among others. Okay, so let's see some of these um, uh, palettes in, in practice um, in a real world example. And here we have a risk map um, um, about a hurricane that is uh, about to hit uh, the mainland in the US. And it's the, the map the uh, NOAA um, administration puts out in the US. And um, it depicts the probability for a tropical storm force wind speed. So it's the probability for a very strong wind occur, not for the cone of the hurricane um, occurring. And uh, we start um, here in the margins uh, with a dark green that corresponds to a probability between 5 and 10 percent. And then we go over the lighter greens, yellow, orange, red, to the dark purple, which corresponds to more than 90 percent probability. And um, yeah, because this is used for communicating to the public, this should be accessible. However, um, if we emulate Deuteranopia, uh, one of the red-green color blindnesses, we see that we actually get very similar colors at uh, different ends of uh, the spectrum here of, uh, of the probability. So this is not a good idea. Another problem, um, if I go back to the original scale, is that um, colors are very flashy. Um, you have a lot of chroma everywhere, so it's not clear where to look at first. And yeah, this non-monotonic change um, in brightness, we can also see in the desaturation version. And here I've replaced this palette uh, with a um, color brewer palette uh, going from light orange to dark red. And this works much better. So we have light colors in the margin with low probabilities. And then we go towards the dark colors. And this is easily understandable for everybody, quite intuitive, robust under desaturation and um, also under um, color vision deficiencies. And so it's a good idea to use something like this in order not to confuse the public or um, the US president for that matter. Well, we don't know how he confused he was due to the colors or um, for some other reasons, but um, it's this map I used here from the justification, his justification in this Sharpie Gate incident that some of you might recall. Okay, I'll use my uh, last uh, two minutes or so to um, touch another topic that often comes up when choosing colors. Um, namely, shouldn't we use uh, or take inspiration from designers, painters and directors who know about color composition and so on. And in order not to rain on anyone's parade, I'm not using an R package here, but I'm choosing colors from one of my favorite directors, Pedro Almodovar. And uh, this is a picture from his movie, Todo Sobre Mi Madre. And uh, this is um, a palette I found online suggested based on this picture. And if you desaturate it, you see it might actually work as a sequential um, color scale going from dark to bright. However, um, if we see the, the full color version, two colors stand out because they have a lot of chroma more than the colors surrounding them. And uh, this is, of course, intended by Almodova, the red and the yellow standing out from the coat, the hair, uh, the background, and so on. But um, if we use this um, in a um, data visualization, we suddenly get emphasis on this low probability region. And also this blood red stands out uh, in the middle, which is not working uh, that great. And this is a much smoother picture, the orange red scale I used before. We can have the same problems uh, for qualitative palettes. Another Almodova movie, Tacones Lejanos, with some great flashy early 90s colors um, that we could extract into a qualitative palette. But again, this wouldn't work very well under color vision deficiencies. 
Okay, so to quickly wrap up, um, um, I hope I've shown you that also Base R now provides you with some tools for choosing palettes so you can have good um, starting points to choose colors. Of course, there are many other nice packages to do so. And you can use, for example, our color space package to check the robustness of, uh, of these palettes. And when you choose colors, be aware to choose an appropriate uh, type of palette. Don't reinvent the wheel, check the robustness and be careful with palettes that have too much chroma everywhere. And to conclude, um, I have some, um, some references here on the slides and you can reach out to me on Twitter. And now I'm already over time and I'm stopping. Thank you very much. Thanks Achim for that insightful talk. Um, our next speaker is Dorothy Gordon. Uh, Dorothy Gordon is the chair of the UNESCO Information for All program, among other things. More notably and awe-inspiring, to me at least, Ms. Gordon has a Wikipedia page, which is notable given the recent analysis by Francesca Tripodi, which found that women's biographies are more likely to be nominated um, for deletion than men's biographies on Wikipedia. Ms. Gordon will speak to us today about making technology accessible, particularly to women and Africans, and how utilizing tools such as R can help advance public policy. Over to you, Dorothy. Thank you for the intro. Um, I hope there will be more women on Wikipedia as it is the world's encyclopedia. Um, let me take a cue from our presenters. My name is Dorothy Gordon. I'm speaking to you from Accra, uh, which is in Ghana, in West Africa. It is after 9 p.m. in the night, and it's quite hot because this is a tropical country. Um, I'm not sure that I've done everything that I should in terms of explaining who I am, but let me just say how happy I am to have been invited to uh, give, to be part of this keynote uh, panel at the very first Global by Design conference that the R community is hosting. Um, it's a pleasure for me to join you because it's already such a diverse and inclusive platform. And we all know how difficult it is to achieve those kind of goals. Today, um, I want to talk to you a bit about your agency and the power of individuals and groups to achieve change. And um, please don't be upset by my next remarks. Uh, for many years, we know that programmers and their close relations, uh, data scientists, enjoyed a uh, reputation as misogynistic nerds given to eating pizza and growing beards. You never saw images of female programmers and um, let alone black programmers, uh, African programmers, forget all that. And this kind of stereotyping is still rife, but in the age of artificial intelligence, it's now morphed into that of the evil programmer, um, referenced in kinder terms by Christiane, um, that kind of person who has deep-rooted biases, an inability to recognize a skewed data set, and a regular perpetrator of algorithmic bias. And for some strange reason, I have found it difficult to explain to the audiences that listen to me at the many conferences I participate in on a humanistic approach to artificial intelligence, I found it difficult to explain to them that most good programmers are simply working to task. They are given 
a set of parameters and they work within those parameters. And if the instructions that they have been given are not clear in terms of expectations, they cannot be expected to fulfill or take those expectations into account. And that is my first statement that I would like to hear some reactions to. Can they be expected to take those issues into account? Because we know that most programmers are working to earn a salary. What is the reaction of the people that are in control? And um, recently, we heard of a very large tech company letting go a black woman uh, because she raised issues of algorithmic bias. So we have to ask ourselves how much agency individual programmers have when addressing these kind of issues. So I do not believe that programmers set out to focus only on biased data sets or design exclusively to reflect um, the viewpoint of a particular subset of the privileged. Uh, I have many friends who come from that privileged group, so I'm not naming the privileged group, but we all know who they are because they say they feel very targeted. So um, how is it that we're able to blame in a way programmers and data scientists, and in fact the tech community for the kind of issues that are far more widespread in terms of our digital ecosystems and the problems we have with big tech uh, whether we want to talk about surveillance capitalism or data capitalism, that we recognize that these new forms of doing business in line with um, developments in cognitive neuroscience do take away agency in the sense that it's far easier to manipulate us these days. And that the concentration of power and control in these companies that um, we find both in the East as well in the West is quite unprecedented. Um, fortunately, there's a lot of attention being paid to algorithmic bias. And we can see that there are algorithmic auditing companies springing up. And I want to suggest to you that all of this is of even greater importance today because of the accelerated digital transformation that has characterized this era of lockdown. It means that everybody is now thinking about how tech affects their lives. And this means that programmers and the languages they use are at center stage. And we all would I won't say we would all, because that's not true. But in line with the values that we are supposed to espouse and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as well as UNESCO's Rome principles that are linked to rights, openness, access, and multi-stakeholder, we would like that our digital ecosystem move in a more inclusive and accessible direction. And when I think of the R community, I think of it as distinct and special. Um, Babanash did not mention the fact that I am on the board of the Linux Professional Institute, something which um, I enjoy doing, but it really gives me an insight to the value of open and R is an open language, exceptional in that way, 
a language which has got a vibrant community that encourages multidisciplinarity in the sense that within that our community, we have people who come from many different disciplines that allow us to have subject insights into the kind of statistics that we are processing. And the fact that you can present your information in different formats, and even those who have a deep-seated fear of data can understand and appreciate the data story is really extremely important. And I just want to talk to you a little bit more about that power of community. Um, I think I have a few more minutes left. And first of all, let me say that for most of my career, I've worked at the level of policy, and I've also worked within government as well as a not-for-profit sector. And I found that people who don't work with policy and government often don't have an idea about how decisions are made with regard to policy, and how very often the people who are targeted by a policy have no clue as to the direction of thinking there. And this is important because we have now moved to, or we are supposed to have moved to a situation of evidence-based policy. So you can see why the R community is so important because the R community gives us the opportunity to have clear evidence and to present it in a way that will make high-level policy makers that perhaps were not very good at statistics and maths when they were in school understand it. But even more importantly, make it available in such a way that communities can actually understand it through the data visualization and that we can have a more inclusive process in actually developing policy. And let me just say, because in my youth, I used to teach policy. And policy is an art, it's not a science. I used to make my students laugh because I would tell them that what happens in parliament may just be a link to who got irritated um, by who the night before and came to parliament in a very bad mood and determined to make sure nothing went through. So um, polit uh, policy is not a science. But today, science can definitely help us to make better policy. And the R community can do that in multiple ways. And because time is limited, just let me mention a few. First of all, you can, as a community, monitor how data is being used. And you can flag when data is being misused. You can flag when the wrong kind of data sets, as Christian explained to us, um, are being used to create a certain analysis. What assumptions? And then as uh, Ahim just mentioned to us, you can also flag when design is not inclusive enough. But I think that um, looking at the issues, Sometimes it's far simpler because we see that, for example, in Africa, and when we are talking about adolescent girls in Africa, there's a huge proportion of them that are not in school. And very many people used to assume that this was a cultural issue, that parents wanted their daughters to get married. They didn't want them to have an education. But actually, when you do the research, the data is very clear that it's more linked to poverty and an inability to afford those necessities that surround going to school. And so parents are keen for their girls to go to school because they recognize, I, I don't think that, um, let me put it this way. I think that parents in Africa love their children the same way everybody loves their children and would like to give them equal opportunity if they could. So 
simple things like this can make a huge kind of difference. And I see a few heads shaking, so may, let me round up quickly and say that um, we signed on as a global community in 2015 and with the implementation in January 2016, we signed on to the Sustainable Development Goals. And we aim to achieve those by 2030. I think that I would like to end by urging the R community to really get involved in providing support to the implementation of the SDGs. There are already several open source communities. For example, there's an open source community around climate change. And so um, let me urge all of you to get involved. And I'm looking forward to having lots of questions from the floor. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Dorothy, for the informative presentation. Um, our last speaker for the session is Jonathan Godfrey. Jonathan is a lecturer of statistics at Massey University in New Zealand. His research is focused on the needs of th the thousands of blind people around the world who need additional tools to make the visual elements of statistical thinking and practice less of a barrier. He is the official disability advisor of FORWARDS. He will discuss how to choose the right tools that make collaboration possible and fruitful so that people from all walks of life can see themselves as part of the community. Over to you, Jonathan. Um, good morning. It's uh, a nice wintry morning here in New Zealand, um, and I'm aware that I can't see everyone else, but at the moment I suspect you can't see me either. So I think someone at the um, official end needs to switch the video on. There we go. Um, so I'm... When I was uh, thrilled to get this invitation, the first word I saw um, in the, the discussion um, that we were having was uh, responsible or responsibility. And I think the first thing that came into my head was, well, what makes the responsibility in the context of this discussion any different to the responsibilities we have in any other walks of life? Um, Perhaps that's because I spend a lot of time being a, um, an advocate for disabled people in my country, especially uh, for those people who happen to be blind. Um, in particular, I'm spending a lot of energy uh, discussing with government agencies uh, how to get disabled people into their data. And that means getting us into their thinking and hopefully then um, helping close the equ equity gaps between disabled people and non-disabled people. The biggest problem we face is that of identifiability. Most organisations don't know who in society is actually disabled or not. And so that means the algorithms do not accommodate us and therefore they can't accommodates. So my work isn't just pure altruism. I mean, as a disabled person myself, I do stand to benefit from those efforts that I make on behalf of other disabled people. And that's probably where my story with R and my research is also centred as well. Most of my contributions started with a need to solve problems that I was having as an individual and being able to share those solutions with people overseas. And I think that's true for many people who are developing or using R. Um, we develop an idea for our personal need, perhaps for our employer, and we share that work with others around us. We might then go on to share that work in a much wider context 
improving our efforts as we respond to the efforts uh, and requests of other people around us. And in the context of my work, I guess the biggest question or the most frequently asked question is what can I do to help blind people? And the problem I have is that there isn't a single magic solution um, that I can offer everyone. It's a conversation I have to be, get into that says, um, well, where are you at? What are you doing? Um, and who are you working with? I can give assurances that we can make classrooms more amenable to blind students and other disabled people. We can definitely make our online presence uh, more user friendly. And we can always make our communities more inclusive. And I won't get time to give you every possible solution. So I'm going to talk about a couple or three. Uh, disabled people, just like any other minority, need to see themselves welcomed, uh, represented and valued. It doesn't matter if we're talking about an analysis of a social issue, as per um, uh, Christian's talk uh, or some of Dorothy's work, um, or organising a conference or documenting our lovely new R package. So the first example I want to um, draw to your attention is that one way to include people is to make them feel welcome by the language we use. And that language very definitely does matter to disabled people. But the problem we have is that the language we prefer is not consistent around the world. Um, that's because different societies of disabled people are very definitely at different stages in their progression out of um, uh, the dark ages for disability into um, a more modern 21st century approach. So in my country and in many countries, I'm not a person with a disability. I'm a disabled person. I wasn't born with a disability and I certainly didn't spend any energy going looking for one. I was born with a medical condition. It's got a lovely flash name that has really no useful bearing on anything but the main symptom that was observable 40 or 50 years ago. That medical condition has led to me not having any useful vision in terms of print, screens, and actually most of my um, environment. That is an impairment. It doesn't actually, though, make me disabled. So it's the exclusive practices of the environment I live in that are the things that disable me. To be disabled means you've been excluded in some way. But when I'm included, I'm no longer disabled. The public transport system in many cities is utterly disabling because I can't tell which bus is the one I want. The tools used in some collaborative settings are disabling to me. Their use and their selection as the tools of choice are what stifle my ability to collaborate with others. The printed books in the library, well, they don't disable me, but the reliance on using those printed books is what disables me. So the academic journals that present their work um, using accessible HTML, they include me. And that's true for most HTML documents. And that means practically all of your work that is written in our markdown has a chance of including me in your audience. But the authors of our markdown documents don't know that they actively did something that included me. All too frequently, and history tells us far too frequently, there's a lot of documentation that goes with software that is presented in a non-accessible form. And most of the time, 
the people who created that documentation were not actually aware that they disabled me. They did make a choice, but perhaps they didn't know the choice they were making and how it affected me. In far too many contexts, users aren't given an ability to make a choice. We are often at the mercy of the default settings. I can go back, uh, it takes me 20 years to cover the example that I'm going to show you about inclusion versus exclusion. And it's actually in the end been one of the most important things in my working life. So 20 odd years ago when I was a graduate student doing a PhD, there was no way for me to type mathematical expressions and be able to convince myself that my readers were going to understand what I wanted them to understand. The equation editing tools in the big software companies of the day were utterly useless to me. I couldn't write it and I certainly couldn't read it. The only option that I had available 20 odd years ago was to write mathematics using LaTeX. That gave me control over what I was putting into my documents, but it didn't give me control and understanding of what anyone was getting out of my documents. So I couldn't actually check my work, leaving me totally reliant on proofreaders who had to be at least as skilled as I was in whatever I was producing. Today, it's a very different world in which I operate. I'm still typing my mathematical expressions using LaTeX notation, but because it's in a markdown context almost all of the time, I end up getting HTML with MathJax embedded mathematical expressions that I can read on my own. And I'm happy. I've got independence today that I did not have 20 years ago. And software has, actually it's always been a problem for blind people. Many interfaces are totally designed with the mouse user in mind. Sometimes in the worst cases, there is no plan B on offer. Use a mouse or walk away. 15 years ago, R was an equalizer. Everyone in, uh, in the R world was working R the same way I was because none of us used the mouse. In recent years, R Studio came along and I, um, I'm saddened to say that R Studio has always been a disabling piece of software for me as a blind person. What I'm really pleased about is that the team at R Studio has put resources into their commitment to making R Studio a more accessible platform for blind people to use. It's still early days, but I really do believe that sometime soon, blind people will be using R Studio alongside their classmates and alongside their colleagues. I think one of my major messages for people will be that if you are creating a document like a package vignette that is spitting out a PDF document, it is as useless to me today as it was 20 years ago. The process of making a vignette in PDF has had no tangible improvements for my ability to engage with that work. It theoretically is possible for you to have produced from LaTeX an HTML document that I could have read, but practically no one knows how to do it. It's not easy. So we all take the option that is on the table in front of us. LaTeX goes to PDF. We now have a choice. We can go from R Markdown to HTML, and you can have your PDF too if you want it. I've got a selection of key mottos that I want um, to uh, leave you with. 
um, a very important motto in disability circles is nothing about us without us. That means get disabled people into your work teams, into your thinking, into your algorithms, and everything you do. Make doing the right things easy to do and the wrong things harder. That's a challenge, I think. All too often, it's too easy to make an inaccessible document because it's easy and making an accessible version is harder. That is not true for R Markdown. It's harder, really, to make a decent PDF out of R Markdown. Uh, good is often going to be labelled as not good enough. But one of the major problems that we have in dis for disabled people is that all too often perfection is the enemy of good. And so we get nothing. I think we need to accept that things are not yet right and that they need to be improved and then make a commitment to making those improvements. Our markdown wasn't perfect at first. And so uh, the numerous improvements that have been built into our markdown, mostly under the hood, away from the end users, uh, only a few of them ever came because blind people asked for them. The two most important things in our markdown documents that make life uh, much easier for me are that the web standards are built in. As users, we don't know that, but web standards are built into what gets put into your HTML document from your R markdown. And MathJax, putting those mathematical expressions in, in readable form, is the other one. My employment today and the employment prospects of blind people around the world has been dramatically improved because of R markdown through to HTML. That means we can succeed in your classrooms. We can succeed in your workplaces. We can succeed as your collaborators. That means we can be included. What that actually means is that we will be less disabled. Uh, to answer the question of what are the most important tools uh, for responsible actions in everything we do, I'm going to revert to a proverb from my country. I'll give you the English version because we haven't got time for the full translation. But the question is, what is it, that most important thing? In the language of uh, Maori, it is he tangata, he tangata, he tangata. If you haven't worked it out, the answer is it is people, it is people, it is people. Thank you so much, Jonathan, and we are grateful to all the presenters for their presentation. We will now quickly move to the Q&A session. And the first question is a general one directed to all of the presenters. Um, what is one question or consideration that is underrated in your opinion, but could move the dialogue forward on inclusion and accessibility? Um, maybe we can start with Ahim. Yes, thanks. Um, like, um, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I, I'm still very impressed with, with Jonathan's talk and I, I have to <laughs> say thank you for, for this. This, uh, um, this is really very, uh, very useful and very important for, for me um uh, as a non-impaired person um to, to to hear and understand about these things so thank you for this and also i my my answer to this this question also relates to something that jonathan said that uh, uh perfect is sometimes the enemy of the good and um when when we have to tackle um such difficult questions um, it's often that they're they're seen as one big compound and um they are uh, um, then very hard to to tackle or address or many uh, um, many people feel that they they couldn't do this alone so um, what I usually do with difficult problems I try to decompose them into into parts and then 
um, I, I try to do two things, the bottom up and the top down thing. So uh, bottom up to do simple things first, uh, where, where it's easy to do something. And this also ties in with what Jonathan said. So where it's already easy to do the right thing, try to foster that uh, and then maybe take, uh, take one or two important points uh, top down where, where it's hard to do the right thing and, and try to make it easier. So decompose the problem and try to do some of the easy things and a few of the hard things as well. That would be my, my answer to the question. Okay, thank you, Ahim. Um, maybe Dorothy, your opinion on the question. Sorry, you're on mute. Sorry. Um, yeah, I think that you were asking something that's been underrated, but could yes. make a big difference. Yes. Is that what you were asking? Yes, but I can repeat the question. You are you. muted. Oh. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not muted. Um, I'm I can't muted. hear you. Am I audible? Uh -huh. Yes, now you are. Okay, um, let me just repeat the question for you. What is one question mm -hmm. or consideration that is underrated in your opinion, but could help move the dialogue forward on inclusion and accessibility? I think it's really very simple. Um, and it's not simple. I, I started my career um, working in rural areas and we often, were asked to go in to provide solutions that were of no relevance to those people. And so um, just as Jonathan said, and this is also the theme that um, was at the heart of the declaration that came out after the year of um, on indigenous languages, the use of indigenous languages, is nothing for us without us. So it's if uh, I saw in the chat somebody was asking how how um, can we make it more inclusive if we are designing a model for somebody, and that target and we don't like to use target anymore when we're doing development issues we don't like to use the word beneficiary anymore but if you say that you're going to work with a particular community the obvious thing is to consult that community and to recognize that that community is not a, a homogenous group that there will be different perspectives within that community. And you have to figure out how you are going to be able to access those different perspectives and build them into your model with the right kind of weighting, et cetera. And so this is why I feel that there is so much power within the R community, because you have that ability to learn from each other, the peer learning that is necessary to figure out how to do that effectively. And each time you go into a different community or a different group, uh, um, you know, a different interest group, you will have to fine tune, you will have to adapt your approach to suit that group. So it's something that's been said ad infinitum, but it is something that bears repeating and for people to understand that it is not easy. There isn't one model in terms of how to do this. A lot of it will be learning by doing. It's a lot of feeling for people, for listening and understanding. Okay. Okay, thank you so much, um, Dorothy. Uh, maybe Jonathan, what's your view on that question? Uh, well, I, I think it's people in the end. Um, if you look around your data analysis and you think that uh, the right people need to be represented in your data analysis, maybe we need to look around our classrooms and our workplaces as well. 
um, if the right people aren't in the room to give you the diversity of opinion, then you better start thinking about where to look outside the room. It's people. Okay, thank you. Um, Kristen? Yeah, I'll piggyback on something both Jonathan and Dorothy just said and, you know, wholeheartedly agree that when it, um, you know, comes to inclusivity, it is absolutely important who's in the room. And this has been something on the types of models I've been taught, I was talking about during my talk that are used in criminal justice. Um, it's really gotten a lot of attention. So over the last, prior to the last several years, I think there was less of a push to have people who are justice involved actually in the room, making decisions, giving opinions on the types of, on, you know, even mundane things about how data should be processed, contextualizing the data up to whether the model should be used at all. I've seen over the last couple of years, a push to have impacted community involved in this process. And the one thing that I think just to sort of very directly answer your question that could make that a much more successful endeavor is to make sure that they're compensated with money. Um, you know, often I, I end up, you know, through my job in, in the rooms where these sorts of decisions are being made. And although I'm not exactly being paid to be there, you know, when I was a professor before I could, you know, sort of decide how I spent my time and part of how I spent my time was interacting in these policy types of roles. Um, and so I was compensated for my time in some way. However, the people who they're asking to participate in these panels from the community really aren't. They're people who have jobs where this sort of activity isn't included as part of their jobs. So you're asking them to take time away from their families. You're asking them to read up on materials on statistical modeling, right? In their spare times so that they might have some small part of their voice heard about how models are going to be impacting them directly. And you're also asking them to maybe take time away from work, maybe pay for childcare, do all of these sorts of things to participate. And that's not right. And so just again, to very directly answer the question, I think to increase inclusivity, we need to make sure that everybody who needs to be in that room is fairly compensated for their time and effort to be in that room. Okay, thank you so much for the response. Um, over to you, Vebash. Thanks everyone. That was uh, a very well answered that question from everyone. Um, so Achim, for you, I, I know you do, did answer this already on the chat, uh, but one of the questions was, could you recommend a way to find good alignment, compatibility between background, the plot layout color, and then the content colors, like the lines and the points and the text? And do you have any advice or resources for creating a divergent palette with greater than seven categories? Yes, thanks. Um, so um, the, the, the short answer is always that there's no one size fits all approach for, for any of this, but the, the usual advice where you should start from is if you have um, a dark background, for example, the neutral color should be close to that background. So if you think about the risk map example from my talk, I would start uh, um, at the low probabilities with a dark color and then go to a bright and very colorful uh, color um, uh, for the high risk uh, regions. And if you have a, a light background, you would do it um, conversely, start um, um, at, um, at the um, light color and go to a dark and colorful color. Um, but there, there are also exceptions, um, like the, the risk map I've shown where the background was neither light or dark, but it was this uh, map with the ocean and, uh, uh, and the land. So um, this doesn't always work, but it's, um, um, it's a good starting point. Usually pick a, a neutral color that uh, um, is close to the background color. And uh, for the um, divergent maps with more than seven categories, um, if you're really concerned about matching the, um, the individual categories and not just getting the impression how things increase, um, then uh, you would probably have to change the U um, along with the di divergence. So go from a yellow towards a red on one side and towards a blue on, on the other side, for example. And there are some examples for this, both in the HCL colors function in base R and in our color space package 
package and the diverging X uh, HCL function. Uh, thanks for that, Achim. Um, Shao, would you like to ask the next question? Yes, sorry. <laughs> um, the next question goes to Christian. How can model development be done more inclusively? Sorry, you're on mute. Uh, sorry, no, I had the unmute. Okay. Um, button button covered. So I think I kind of actually just answered, I think I may have jumped the gun a little bit and answered um, that question a little bit already. Already, So I'll, I'll repeat some of the things I just said with less of an emphasis on, on the paying. So I still think that's really important. Um, you know, I think making sure that people who are going to be directly impacted by the model, making sure their, their voices are heard. And I think often this tends to happen at the end of the process after all these sorts of decisions have been made, including what the goal is of even introducing a model, um, what type of model is going to be built, um, you know, what data is going to be used. And then sort of at the end, it's almost looked for like, okay, what do you sort of, you know, get some feedback, what do you think? Um, sort of knowing what we know about how models are developed, what that pipeline looks like, I think people who have the most experience and like experiential knowledge about the data need to be involved from the get-go in formulating that ultimate goal, in deciding whether a predictive model or any other sort of model is the best way to move, to move towards that goal. If you decide that a model is going to be used towards that goal, contextualizing the data. I cannot say how important it is to have people who actually understand what's going on in data there to, to, help, to help, help you understand what it means, right? Data, Often when you get it as sort of a statistician or maybe data scientist, it, 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 you know, it can look like raw data. It can look like something that's not an extremely intelligible. It can be a little bit divorced from sort of like the humanity of the person who's being measured, right? And sort of having someone there who can contextualize what say a measurement might mean or like what a prior arrest might mean or what the context of that might mean and how you ought to handle that in a way that's sensitive and, and, and reflective of their experience, I think can, can really set the tone for how, how that measurement should be done, if it should be done at all, how you can account for all the sorts of nuances in the real world that you just aren't going to get if you're sort of completely, if you're a person who's completely external to the process, if you're sort of coming in as an outsider doing data analysis and sort of imposing your idea of what the data means on other people. So keeping, keeping, keeping impacted folks in the loop throughout, I think is, is, is probably another another path to take for, for more inclusion. That's Jonathan speaking. Can I add to that by saying that actually the way we phrase our questions and we frame up what we're even going to do comes with its inherent biases and you know the identifiability in the data is absolutely crucial but actually identifiability in the questions before the data gets collected and how we, we frame up what it is we're trying to achieve, I think is one of the most important things that Christian just said. Thank you. Thank you. I think because of time, we'll just allow Dorothy to give us her last amazing words because um, we need to wrap up. So tell us something, last words. <laughs> Well, you mean I can talk about anything? <laughs> but I, I just want to say uh, how much I enjoyed the session. Um, really, uh, we've had such great insights into fields that I've never really thought about, um, notably uh, color blindness. I've talked a lot about the predictive analysis on um, the software that is being used by the crim criminal justice system in, in the US. But um, Christian, let us see how we could do things differently. Um, there are a lot of communities now working on these kind of issues. And for me, uh, I feel that we are always trying to feel our way to do things better. And um, this is why the power of open and the power of R is so important uh, because it allows for that learning to take place, a shared, a knowledge sharing that is really important if we're going to figure things out. 
And as people are trying to figure things out on a daily basis, I would like them to remember that they have a very important role in shaping what our global future is going to look like. Because if we allow, um, how could I, if we don't work better towards um, accessibility and inclusivity, we will not have the kind of society that anyone will feel comfortable in. So thank you. Okay, thank you so much. So we are done with the Q&A session. We are grateful to all the speakers for teaching us about different considerations we should have when it comes to accessibility and inclusion. We have much more tools to use going forward in our R journey. We are also grateful to Absalon again for sponsoring the session and to Juan and Ben for being our amazing hosts. We cannot forget to thank everyone else who attended this session um, today. For those who want to interact with the speakers after this, you can head over to Slack and join the channel hashtag key underscore rest underscore prog. And speaking of algorithmic bias, we will be having a viewing session for the documentary recorded by us um, during this conference. This is a documentary directed by Shalini Kantaya that investigates the bias in algorithms after MIT Media Lab researcher Joy uncovered flaws in facial recognition technology. It will be available for viewing from July 6th to 8th July at 12 noon UTC. And we'll have a channel open on Slack for discussions regarding the film. So what do we have? What do we have lined up next? Um, we'll have a break for oops, have a break for 30 minutes, after which um, at 10:30 p.m. UTC, we'll have an incubator session where we'll cover five principles to grow your our community. And later on at 11:30 p.m. UTC, we will you can choose to either um, attend the my R community meeting or recharge through a yoga session. Um, and that's all from our end. We hope to see you around for the remainder of the conference. Adios.